All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, today is November 9th, 2023. My name is Dr. Madeline Verhovsek. I'm the Chief of Medicine here at St. Joseph Healthcare Hamilton. Um, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to this week's Citywide Medical Grand Rounds. Next slide, please. All right. And um, we'll start with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that St. Joseph Healthcare Hamilton sits on the traditional territories of the Mississaugas and the Haudenosaunee nations and is within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. <clears throat> this is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and to protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. And I'm also going to draw our attention, so uh, all of us know that Saturday, November 11th, uh, this week, is Remembrance Day. I'll also uh, use this moment to draw your attention. As many of you may know, yesterday, November 8th, was National Indigenous Veterans Day which is a day of remembrance and commemoration of the contributions of Indigenous veterans in the First and Second World Wars and the Korean War. National Indigenous Veterans Day began in Winnipeg in 1994 and is now celebrated across Canada. Over 12,000 Indigenous people are estimated to have volunteered in all three wars and more than 500 died during these conflicts. This National Indigenous Veterans Day, we would like to express our gratitude for the contributions of Indigenous veterans to Canada and to the world. And with that, we'll go to the next slide. And um, it's my honor to welcome Dr. Amanda Huynh, who's uh, presenting today as part of our quote unquote new recruit uh, series. So we like to welcome any new full-time faculty members within the Department of Medicine to give a presentation, typically within their first year on faculty. Um, and Dr. Huynh today will be presenting on the topic of a quality improvement approach to healthcare impact on climate change. And I'll highlight that this is um, the third in a bit of a um, ad hoc kind of series on climate change uh, that's going to be building on some of what's been discussed in past medical grand rounds. Uh, and I'm also delighted to welcome my co-host, Dr. Jason Chung, who is the head of service for general internal medicine at St. Joe's. And he's going to give us a bit more of an introduction to Dr. Van. Thanks so much, uh, Madeline. Um, it brings me great pleasure to introduce you all to Dr. Amanda Huynh. Uh, Amanda has been with us for a couple of years now as a uh, staff and attending physician here at St. Joe's. Um, she had completed her training uh, in core internal medicine and GIM here at McMaster and subsequently completed additional fellowship training in obstetrical medicine. Uh, both here as well as in Toronto and BC. Um, her practice uh, involves both uh, looking after patients on the GIM wards and outpatient clinics, as well as obstetric medicine patients. And she, of course, has a particular interest in quality improvement, uh, having completed a master's in quality improvement and patient safety uh, at the University of Toronto. Um, currently, Amanda is our uh, brave CTU director here at St. Joe's. Um, and uh, we are very fortunate to have her as one of our faculty members. So take it away, Amanda. Thank you. Thank you, Jason, for that very warm introduction. Um, so I do want to start by saying that there has been a lot of drive in the last year or so in terms of how local institutions and ho sorry, how hospital institutions and large scale organizations can work together to mitigate the risks of climate change. However, my talk, I'm going to shift gears a little bit today and focus on how we can mitigate these risks in a more tangible, pragmatic manner at a smaller scale. Um, so that's whether it's directly on the wards or the clinic and how we can champion our learners to do the same. So I have no conflicts of interest to declare. Um, so this is a, an aerial photo of Quebec, to Quebec just this past year during peak wildfire season. As you can see, there's little spots there of smoke, which indicate each one being a wildfire. Um, <clears throat> to give a bit more perspective, every single province and territory in Canada were affected by wildfires this year. And the wildfire season in Canada was so significant that it encompassed 6,400 fires alone, which accumulated to 1,070, sorry, 176,000 uh, kilometer, square kilometers of land, which is equivalent to the size of 
uh, Greece. Um, so that's pretty significant. This led to very severe air quality alerts. I have a picture here in New York City demonstrating kind of how, how severe this impact was. And, um, you know, leading New York City to become the third worst city in the world in terms of air quality at that point. Um, the smoke was so significant that the wild, from the wildfires in Canada in general that it crossed the Atlantic Ocean, even reaching Europe and impacting their air quality there. This is a photo from Nova Scotia. So they saw 9.8 inches of rain in a 24-hour period in peak um, in the summer this year um, and had dramatic consequences for health and, and safety as well. And the impact of climate change, um, not only was impact in Canada, of course, but we saw um, heat waves, drought across the world, Europe, China, North America, um, Phoenix, Arizona, uh, saw temperatures of 43 degrees Celsius uh, for 21 consecutive days this summer. So it's actually been predicted that the Gulf Stream may also collapse as soon as 2025, leading to a tipping point with other catastrophic consequences. And this is all related to global warming and the burning of fossil fuels, which essentially leads to increased greenhouse gas emissions, leading to the rise of the average global temperatures. So this is the outline of my talk today. Um, I'll quickly review carbon emissions and how healthcare is involved and how we contribute to that. Um, I'll go over what sustainable healthcare is and then review quickly how we can actually help um, in our local environment from a quality improvement perspective. So carbon emissions and the healthcare sector's contribution. So this is the greenhouse effect. It's a process through which heat is trapped near the surface of the earth um, by substances known as greenhouse gases. Um, the, this can be carbon dioxide, methane, ozone, nitrous oxide, and water vapor. And it's it's essentially the Goldilocks effect where, you know, there's a certain amount of this um, is important uh, to maintain life on Earth, to maintain warmer temperatures on the Earth globally. Otherwise, our atmosphere would be about zero Fahrenheit. Um, but in excess, um, it can lead to catastrophic events that we've already seen this year. So in light of global warming in the past few years, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change had uh, set out a goal that the global temperature rise can be no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius from the pre-industrial levels. So pre-industrial times were the mid 18th century before we had widespread industrialization where you know large amounts of coal began to be burned for um, fossil fuels and, and leading to increased gas, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So that 1.5 degrees Celsius seems like a, a very, very tight threshold that we have to stay under. Um, and in order to do this, they had determined that our greenhouse gas emissions must decrease by 45% by 2030 and reach a net zero by 2050. These are these are very reach goals. Like they seem very, very uh, difficult to attain uh, given our current climate in the last year. We've already reached a global temperature of above 1.4 degrees Celsius pre-industrial times um, in July alone. So you know, why are we talking about this? I think we can all acknowledge that there are a lot of benefits to reduce carbon emissions. Um, if there is better air quality, um, hopefully that encourages more physical activity. If um, we encourage less automobile traveling to reduce carbon emissions, that can mean increased walking, cycling, or transit, um, and reduce automobile crashes in general. Um, switching from a meat-heavy to a plant-forward diet um, in the context of reducing carbon emissions um, can mean reduced cardiovascular disease, malignancy rates, and so on. And then, as we've seen, um, reduced global warming can cause, uh, sorry, can be related to le less heat related deaths, other catastrophic weather events, floods, wildfires, tornadoes, um, and reduce um, infectious disease transmissions, as we've seen in, in the uh, past grand rounds a few weeks ago. So, where do greenhouse gas emissions come from? So there are five main sectors that uh, produce a significant amount of greenhouse, ga ga greenhouse gas emissions. The first one is electricity generation. The second one is through industry. Um, agriculture is a contributor as well. Buildings and commercialization, as well as transportation. 
And transportation is the number one contributor. However, buildings and commercialization, um, and that's where healthcare falls under, is the number two. Um, so to give everyone a bit of perspective, um, to compare com kind of how large an impact healthcare has on carbon emissions, I'm gonna first talk about transportation. So worldwide, carbon emissions from transportation from airplanes alone is about 3.5% of the net global uh, amount of carbon emissions. Um, and, you know, there's been a lot of criticism the last few years looking at celebrities who have been using private jets. Um, and so if we're already criticizing the sector and they're only contributing to 3.5%, let's take a look at healthcare. So from a global perspective, the healthcare sector contributes about 5.2% um, in total. Um, and this has significantly increased in the last uh, few years. So from 2000, uh, the year 2000 to 2015, it has increased by 29%. And the healthcare sector on its own is the fifth largest emitter on the planet. The Canadian healthcare system is the second highest per capita emitter of greenhouse gases amongst healthcare systems worldwide. And we're looking how that impacts health. That's about 23,000 years of life lost from disability or early death annually. So if we were to break down where carbon emissions come from in the healthcare sector, um, typically we define carbon emissions uh, under three scopes, scope one, two, and three. So in the bottom right is a first scope. This is um, under the scopes, uh, sorry, carbon emissions that fall under the direct control of the healthcare facility. So looking at on-site fuel combustion, fleet vehicle use, anesthetic gas leaks that really contribute to carbon emissions. Scope two is the top left, and that is any electricity that's purchased by the hospital to keep the hospital running. Um, so lighting, powering, machinery, and, and imaging. Um, and then scope three, sitting at 71% of all contributions, is the, our largest scope, and that's indirect emissions. So we're looking at, you know, purchase supplies and what uh, waste and, and carbon emissions are contributed to that, um, employee commuting to and from the hospital, or even waste disposal. And this is another perspective, breaking down the U.S. healthcare system in terms of their uh, um, greenhouse gas emissions. So hospital care contributes the most, so inpatient hospital care, sorry, contributes the most to greenhouse gas emissions. But you can see other things like prescription drugs, outpatient physician and clinical services, um, nursing care facilities, and so on. So the bottom line here is that when we are evaluating healthcare's carbon emissions and where we can intervene, we really should be thinking about everything from start to finish, or in other terms, this life cycle analysis, which is essentially a cradle to grave assessment of everything um, that is associated with healthcare from any product, from any activity, um, from manufacturing um, to its use and its uh, ultimate disposal. So what is the definition of sustainable healthcare? So the WHO in 2017 set out a definition. They said that a sustainable health system improves, maintains, and restores health while minimizing negative impacts on the environment and leveraging opportunities to restore and improve it to the benefit of the health and well-being of current and future generations. So I'll share with you a success story. This is a graph from the NHS, a UK health system. And um, they've been working um, for the past decade or more now, actually, um, to reduce carbon emissions um, in the entirety of the NHS. And um, along the x-axis axis is a uh, timeline, um, and then the y-axis is uh, carbon emissions. And you can see in the black solid line so far is that, um, you know, that's what they've accomplished. Um, and the top of the dotted line in purple is their projection that they did nothing. And then with aggressive interventions, that's the, the ongoing downtrend uh, towards the bottom. And so they've already reduced their greenhouse gas emissions from 1990 to 2020 by 26%. So it is possible, it's doable now acknowledging that their healthcare system is quite different than ours and their ability to leverage these changes is quite easy. But they were working on things like um, technical engineering based interventions to improving 
buildings, transport systems, rethinking new models of care that will enable more sustainable and a less carbon intensive approach to healthcare. So how can we help? Um, so the, the Choosing Wisely had identified three tangible steps to improve climate change in our healthcare system in a local environment, in our micro system. Um, the first one is identification of specialty specific climate intensive overuse priorities. And um, the second one is talking about quality improvement initiatives. And then the third one is advocacy. So let's focus on what these um, specialty specific climate intensive overuse pri priorities are that we can reduce in our environment to reduce carbon emissions. Oops, sorry. So, um, there are five different climate change overuse priorities that were identified uh, through Choosing Wisely. Um, this is kind of, um, the first one is decreasing energy use. Um, so they're talking about like uh, electricity, lighting, imaging, you know, reconsidering, do we really need that um, x-ray again for this patient with chronic low back pain? Or another factor that they brought up from choosing wisely was to be very considerate of um, initiating patients for chronic dialysis um, and ensuring that there's a shared decision-making process involved. Um, because dialysis itself is a very resource-intensive process that consumes large amounts of water, electricity, and single-use plastic materials. Transportation, as we know, is a big contributor of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, one of their thoughts here is that, um, you know, if care can be delivered in an outpatient setting, to try to highly encourage that because hospitals are high cost settings that use a lot of energy um, and, uh, it, you know, they're, they're very resource intensive as well. Another thought is, is there any way we can reduce um, transportation to and from hospitals or minimize that as well? Gases, and I'll talk about this in my next few slides as well. So um, minimizing the use of anesthetic gases, especially nitrous oxide, which I, is, is explicitly a greenhouse gas. Um, and this is commonly used for inhalation anesthetics or induction um, and uh, desflurane as well. And consider switching to um, any or uh, sorry, inhalation anesthetic that is less detrimental to the environment. Medication overuse is a very common um, contributor of climate change. Um, we're talking here about all the steps in between from manufacturing to disposal um, that uses a lot of resources, um, including the distribution um, of medications. So doing a med review anytime you are planning to prescribe a new medication or um, coming up with different ways to avoid polypharmacy in older adults as well. And the last um, overuse priority would be uh, medical devices and supplies. Um, a lot of unnecessary lab tests generate single-use plastic waste, other disposable lab resources and energy, um, and then patients traveling to and from um, outpatient labs uh, kind of contribute to the transportation there can contribute to um, increased gas greenhouse gas emissions as well. So is there a way we can consider add-on testing to pre-existing blood work or reduce or combine duplicate orders? Um, this is a, and I love this diagram, this was um, created by Dr. Miles Schott Sargent, and I think there was a grand rounds where this was highlighted a year ago with Zara Khaled and Dr. Miles Sargent as well. And um, basically, this is kind of like the low hanging fruit of where we can target um, for carbon emissions um, in healthcare. In healthcare. Um, so just to give you a bit of perspective on this diagram, on the, um, I guess, the uh, y axis on the far left here they're talking about you know whether certain interventions would be cost saving or it would uh, contribute more cost to the hospital um, and then the size of this peach um, in terms of uh, the larger the size versus the smaller so larger would have more financial return on investment compared to the smaller ones and then the color of the peach is also important so um, orange ones are what they call game changers that really do contribute to greenhouse gas, uh, greenhouse gas savings whereas um, yellow is intermediate and then 
green lasso. So if you look here, you're looking at like the orange peach that is large in size and lower on the tree or even on the ground, we have deprescribing, we have um, reduced desflurane, which is an inhalation anesthetic um, or OR ventilation setback. So there's, a, there's different things here that um, it's a great visual to see where we can pick our low hanging fruit as well. So moving on to quality improvement initiatives. Um, and so I'm just gonna quickly review quality improvement methodology. And then in this next section, I'm gonna share with you three different quality improvement uh, projects that have been successful in reducing these overuse priorities. So what is quality improvement? It is a very broad range of um, activities um, of varying degrees of complexity and methodological and statistical rigor through which healthcare providers develop, implement, and assess small-scale interventions, identify those that work well, implement them more broadly in order to improve clinical practices. And there's this famous quote by Albert Einstein who said, you know, insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting change. So you know, all improvement involves change. We need to make a change to see um, some improvement in our healthcare system, but not all changes result in improvement. And this is where the model for improvement or uh, QI methodology is important so that we can actually test and, and uh, show um, cause and effect. So the model of improvement is the most common model for QI methodology, and it's looking at four different steps, um, establishing an aim, um, you know, what is our goal that we're trying to accomplish, whether it's reducing uh, frequent blood work, um, reducing inhalation anesthetics, um, and then setting out a uh, measures, so data that we will collect for this. And in QI terminology, we call this the family of measures. Um, so a quick overview. So we have our primary outcome measure, which is the overall goal of this project that we're trying to improve. A process measure itself is looking at any change idea or intervention that we've created and, and, and evaluating its uptake or the fidelity of it. And then a balancing measure is always important in QI pro, um, projects um, to look at if there are any unintended consequences downstream from our project, because we don't want you know, us to leverage improvement in one very finite aspect of the healthcare system, but cause other problems downstream. Um, and then this involves a very dedicated baseline analysis and root cause analysis, trying to determine what is contributing to the problem at hand. And once we understand that fully, that's when we can make changes and, and roll out our intervention through PDSA cycles. So a quick overview of uh, a run chart. Um, so on the uh, x-axis is time, and then on the y-axis is the outcome measures that we're trying to improve. And so um, this is usually what we see for baseline, the current state before any intervention has been uh, started. And this is where we do our root cause analysis to really understand the problem at hand. And as you can see by week 13 in this um, sample graph, changes were implemented and we saw a significant reduction in unnecessary blood draws, for example. Um, so that's the ideal um, quality improvement project. Um, again, nothing is ever as smooth as this in the real world, um, but acknowledging that this is kind of how we represent the uh, data. And so there are different tools that we can use for root cause analysis. I'm going to really just go over two. Um, that's process mapping and fishbone diagram. So um, process maps is essentially documenting the steps of any procedure or process from start to finish. Um, and it's really, really helpful to outline the steps in between and to see where we are experiencing waste or inefficiencies in our, our system and identifying that through, so this is the legend that we use for it, but identifying that through an analysis called the value add or non-value added step analysis. So value add is any step that you find is important that we should probably keep but uh, non-value add is anything that could be removed um, or um, not uh, valuable to the patient itself. And then the fishbone, I personally love this diagram um, as a brainstorming tool. Um, as you can see, the head of the fish is, is essentially like the problem that you're trying to solve. And then you have large categories, which is the, I guess, the bone of each fish. So 
patient family environment, equipment, policies, procedures, and, and healthcare provider factors. And then you brainstorm a bunch of different barriers um, that's contributing to each of the um um, the, to contribute to the problem at hand. And this is a great way to just sort of throw all the ideas on there in a visualized, uh, in, a, in, a, in a diagram so people can visualize it easier. Um, sorry. And so when we do think about creating an intervention or change idea, um, you know, we're not trying to change the whole system. It's, uh, you know, we don't, um, as we know, there's been a lot of talk about physician burnout and kind of everyone being at capacity. So, you know, the goal is to design um, a change idea or an intervention that has, um, you know, minimal workload, but highly perceived value to the organization or the department or local environment. Um, and this is a, um, I guess, schematic representation of change ideas in terms of how effective and how, um, based on um, you know certain factors, uh, how effective the change ideas are. This is called the hierarchy of effectiveness. So change ideas or interventions, um, I split it up here, or this graph is split up here into system-based interventions or person-based interventions. And um, least effective is people-based because we're relying on memory, we're relying, you know, we know that um, to uh, humans make mistakes. Um, so there's no automation, there's no automatic kind of process that happens. But if you're creating an intervention that is embedded in the EMR system, um, or that is automated somehow with uh, force functions, those are more effective, of course, because we're not relying on human nature and memory to kind of carry out these change ideas. So once you have a change idea, then you go through uh, PDSA cycles. Now, PDSA cycles are very, very small scale tests that are ramped up. So multiple iterations of testing. I guess my best example of this is, um, and I'm sure everyone has heard of WD-40. So the reason it's called WD-40 is because the company took 40 attempts to perfect the solution um, to um, stop water corrosion. So um, that's essentially, we're not telling, we're not saying that most PDSA cycles get to 40, but there are multiple small scale iterations of their change idea. And so that's when you do your PDSA cycles and hopefully see improvement um, in this theoretical run chart that I have here. So going through some examples of quality improvement, successful quality improvement projects um, in literature. So this is a study uh, done looking at um, improving um, or reducing um, ana anesthetic um, inhalation uh, induction. And so uh, it was carried out in a large coordinated care pediatric health system. And this was considered, um, there was two pediatric hospitals, one of which was the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and three standalone ambulatory surgical centers. And um, they included all children who underwent an inhalation induction via face mask over a 20 month period. And just to kind of go through um, their method, uh, so their aim was to decrease the environmental impact of inhalation induction in pediatric patients uh, with two factors. The first one being the reduction of nitrous oxide use from 80% of all their patients to 20%. And then the second one is to reduce a maximum FGF, which is fresh gas flow. It's kind of like the, the dosing of um, anesthetic given to the patient um, per minute by 25%. Um, and to give you a bit of um, an idea of this, so fresh gas flow um, is used uh, typically to... Um, it's like a dose for the inhalation anesthetic to uh, speed up induction. So they they usually say that um, a level up to the patient's minute ventilation, which is determined by weight, um, is ideal. You don't need excess of this to um, induce the patient. Um, however, um, oh, so and so the 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 minimum requirement is 0 0.15 liter per minute per kilogram. And in this hospital institution, they were already using um, an, an elevated level of 0 0.53. Um, so they were hoping to reduce that by 25%. 
What were their measures? So they were looking at um, percentage of inhalation inductions where nitrous oxide was used and the maximum FGF during uh, induction of anesthesia across, which is an, the average across all patients. They had some balancing measures. So if they were cutting back on their in inhalation um, induction technique and nitrous oxide use. They wanted to see some potential downstream effects like poor induction time or uh, poor induction quality. So they, they had measures to kind of look at that. And these are my change, the, their change ideas, um, which I will go through in more detail in the next slide. And then they did iterative PDSA cycles to see if there was any improvement. So in terms of their PDSA cycles, the very first one was um, having a grand round stock, a visiting professor lecture to uh, highlight the importance of climate change and how um, uh, and how an the anesthesia department can um, work together to kind of improve the healthcare's um, um, carbon emissions. The second PDSA cycle that they've added onto this was um, a divisional survey with a follow-up educational section, se uh, session. So in this survey, they found that 65% had uh, the survey response rate and 30% of all staff used uh, routinely used nitrous oxide. Interestingly, 70% uh, of um, respondents said that complete elimination of nitrous oxide would be a significant practice change for them. So this is a good, it gives them a good sense of what barriers um, they may have, to, they may encounter in the context of this quality improvement project. And uh, it was noted that the common reason for nitrous oxide use was to increase the speed and smoothness of inhalation induction. And um, we do know that, you know, nitrous oxide doesn't necessarily add to increased speed or smoothness of this. So um, they, in that context, they provide education back to the division within that same week, um, and again uh, a few weeks later on the environmental impact of nitrous oxide um, to see if that will have any impact on um, the overall hospital's use. The third a PDSA cycle that they did were visual reminders. So they had these cards that I've uh, shown here laminated next to the flow meters um, in the ORs. Um, and it demonstrated the minimum and safe effective uh, weight-based fresh gas flow um, for induction. And so it was readily available right next to the flow meters. So when the anesthesiologist was ready to up titrate uh, the dosing, they could see the appropriate dose that they needed right then and there. And then lastly, they had additional rem reminders. So using screensavers on computers um, and also printouts um, in areas where there were no screensavers available. So here's their results. Um, you can see over time that there was a general improvement on the y-axis we're looking here at um, inductions with nitrous oxide use. So before the intervention, they were sitting at some sorry 81.5 percent of use for all patients, and it has decreased about 15 percent ultimately at the end of the their quality improvement project. Um, so pretty pretty good results right there. Um, in terms of the fresh gas flow, um, you can see improvement as well. So um, at the very beginning, they were giving uh, rates of 0.54 liters per minute per kilogram, um, and that improved to 0.37 with their interventions. So bottom line, um, interestingly, the visiting professor lecture had the most profound impact um, in this quality improvement study, um, and, but then a gradual improvement was seen with subsequent educational sessions and uh, reminders. Um, so the bottom line here is that expert and continuous advocacy in education is very important, and it actually resulted in a cultural change in the hospital system, um, which is achievable with QI methodology, and it can start very, very small with just one grand rounds talk. Um, the focus of the QI project was only focused on inhalation induction and not anesthetic, anesthetic gas use for the whole OR. And so um, the learning point here is that uh, they, you know, you start small and, and limit your scope for QI projects initially and then expand further if uh, you've demonstrated success. So a second study that I wanted to highlight is relating to uh, puffer use or uh, meter dose inhalers. So 100 doses of like a 
blue puffer like Ventolin um, is equivalent to a 290 kilometer car journey, which is essentially half of my drive to a little more than half of my drive to Ottawa that I do a few times a year. Um, if you think about an admission to hospital for COPD, um, we're prescribing two to four puffs every four to six hours and sometimes even more. So one patient might be achieving 100 doses already um, within their admission. Um, so that's a pretty substantial uh, contribution to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the Cascades um, uh, program, they are affiliated with Toronto, but they are really um, kind of championing sustainable health care in general. And they've set out um, this uh, picture, uh, sorry, this uh, schematic representation of like which puffers are actually safer for the environment compared to the the MDIs. So in orange um, are the ones that are least uh, preferable um, for the environment. Um, and that includes any kind of um, MDIs that we typically use. Um, and then the green um, are dry powdered inhalers. And um, we're hoping to encourage more of that use. So there was a study done in St. Mike's Hospital in uh, Toronto uh, with not yet published data looking at trying to improve um, dry powder inhaler use and reduce MDI inhaler use. So their overall aim was to reduce estimated number of patients using MDIs. So they had the estimate about 2,200 patients by 40% by March of 2023. Um, and this was equivalent to a decrease in 880 prescriptions. Um, in their presentation, they also highlighted that this reduction would equate to almost six round trips around the sun, uh, sorry, the world, or just halfway to the moon. Um, and their measures were a number of MDI prescriptions versus number of dry powdered uh, inhalation prescriptions. And their change idea was um, what they called prescription favorites. Um, so they had embedded in their EMR system and prescription pads. Um, preferred puffers to prescribe um, for these patients who have either asthma or COPD or other needs, um, and then did multiple PDSA cycles. So what did they find? So um, this is kind of their representation of the data um, across the x-axis is time, and then the number of prescriptions um, on the y-axis. And you can see they noted where they had intervened with their prescription favorite change idea um, of, around week eight or week nine. In blue is the dry powdered um, puffers that we are trying to uh, improve use of, and we're trying to decrease the use of the orange. And you can see a little bit of an uptick in the blue um, for dry powder inhalers um, over the six, 16 week period that they had. Um, so there was a little bit of success here. This is kind of a, a testament that, you know, QI projects are not always perfect and, and that there needs to be more iterations or more PDSA cycles to kind of improve this process overall. But there's a signal here for improvement. Cascades had listed other strategies um, to reduce MDI use. So prescriber support, um, things like having posters or charts in the clinic room to remind prescribers um, or trigger tools in the EMR, um, and then avoiding prescribing inhalers unless there's a confirmed diagnosis of asthma or COPD um, with PFTs. Collaboration with pharmacies is important, um, and then collaboration with patients, because sometimes some patients do prefer the MDI over over the dry powder inhalers, um, and then physician education with grand rounds, academic half days, and so on. And the last study I wanted to take you through is uh, reducing inappropriate laboratory testing in the hospital setting. Um, how well can we go? This is a study done at Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto. And uh, they looked at all patients admitted to the general internal medicine service over a two year period. Um, so their aim was to reduce all laboratory investigations on a general internal medicine service. Um, and they measured just the number of routine blood tests, so CBC, creatinine electrolytes, ordered per inpatient day. Um, and their change idea, the main one, was um, they had this EMR order set that uh, was automatically choosing blood work daily times three, and they just switched it to daily times one. Um, and then they had uh, PDSA cycle two was resident education. And then the third one was a clinician audit and feedback. And then they did PDSA cycles. So the first PDSA cycle here, um, you know, 
they changed that daily times three order set to daily times one, um, but uh, clinicians could still order daily times three or any specified duration, um, but they would just have to do so manually. And then this resident education um, was kind of uh, addressing diagnostic uncertainty and, and kind of the importance of uh, choosing wisely and not uh, over investigating. And then the last one is a clinician audit. So they did um, the MD teams or MDs in general received real-time performance data on how frequently they were ordering blood tests um, compared to the institutional benchmark. And this was emailed to them every two weeks. So uh, here is their um, data. Um, so you can see that there was a subtle improvement. Um, if you're looking at the kind of the bluish green mean line at the back, it did shift down a little bit um, over time after they started their intervention. They saw with this a 6.7% relative reduction in mean number of tests per day, which was a 6.2 relative reduction in costs per inpatient day, translating to a total savings of $26,800 almost dollars. Um, and so that was a pretty significant amount, even though on the graph it looks fa fairly minor, um, that they, they were able to save the hospital about $27,000 per year. So now that we talked about one and two, let's talk about number three a little bit. Um, and um, ultimately, my goal here is to kind of review three themes that motivate healthcare providers towards climate change in general. So the question is here, like how can we as individuals within our own sphere of influence champion our department, our colleagues, residents to make changes? Like what is needed? What motivates our healthcare providers? And this is uh, from Choosing Wisely, and this is what they had found. Um, there needs to be concern about the health implications of climate change. Um, so that should, could be reflected through ongoing conversations conversations, rounds, journal clubs, sharing of relevant data as motivators, um, and then incorporating education uh, or planetary health into medical education research or QI curriculum. Um, interestingly, there is a paper that showed that only 15% of medical schools worldwide incorporate planetary health in their curriculum in any sense. The second thing is that these healthcare providers must recognize or have some frustration that there's a lot of healthcare waste. Um, and that can be done through education um, and kind of looking at, you know, is there, is there additional surgical waste, laboratory waste, patient um, care gowns, socks, and unnecessary testing. Um, I, I do want to highlight that in 2020, 73% um, of the global discharge of plastic waste was related to PPE from COVID. Um, so significant to, from healthcare in general. And then the last point here is recognizing their locus of influence as physicians. And we all know that we are in a very privi privileged uh, position as we have knowledge of our healthcare system. We have um, a rapport with our patients and um, this empowered role that we can actually leverage and hopefully champion change. Um, so we need to kind of steer away from the notion that climate change is peripheral to our individual roles, and that is the work of public health uh, professionals. Um, and it doesn't have to be organizational level advocacy or policy level or macro level changes, but within our own sphere of influence, within our own department, our own ward, our own clinic, that we can start making these small changes. And what are enablers of physician engagement in healthcare sustainability? So, um, Having support from the macro meso level is important. So, um, you know, healthcare sector leadership, governments, agencies, having institutional leadership in the hospital um, and organization is important as well. And then recognizing that budget constraints can also be a barrier to taking some of these initiatives. Um, having organizational and team supports is an enabler of engagement in healthcare sustainability. Um, so having, you know, diverse experience, um, you know, thinking about um, supportive colleagues and, um, and recognizing our own limitations and what we don't know and leveraging kind of other experts in um, our local environment. And then knowledge generation is very, very important. Um, and I've talked about that kind of through rounds and education. So. 
looking for kind of the next steps and what we can do. Um, we're really focusing on, you know, what can we do at, in Hamilton or in McMaster to kind of leverage climate change. Um, so research, um, QI projects could be um, an idea um, per uh, that we can start, um, or research projects studying the impact of healthcare on climate change and carbon emissions, um, looking at education, so grand rounds, multidisciplinary rounds, conferences, um, and embedding the planetary health curriculum into medical school education or any QI or research curriculum, or even tacking on at the very end of like CBLs, you know, um, or didactic lectures, morning report, bedside teaching, is there a component of planetary health that we can talk about um, related to patient care? Um, sending out comments on newsletters, um, posters, brochures, and screensavers, group events, um, and then leveraging patients and their families to uh, help with um, um, sustainable health care as well. So um, my last slide will be talking about potential QI ideas at McMaster just to help stimulate some ideas. So in terms of decreased energy use, you know, can we reduce CT heads for low risk inpatient falls, reducing spine imaging for chronic back pain? Are there ways we can decrease transportation, such as uh, increasing use of virtual care, care platforms to reduce patient transportation to and from hospital, um, changing to electric ambulance uh, ambulances? Um, are there ways we can reduce harmful gases um, and increase the use of these dry powder inhalers and reduce nitrous oxide for anesthesia induction? And then ways to reduce um, unnecessary medication use with antibiotic resource stewardship, unnecessary PPI use of benzos for sleep, and then um, supplies and devices, uh, which is you know, increasing the use of reusable surgical gowns or reusable PPE. Um, primary prevention, um, hopefully, and then reducing unnecessary blood work or fully catheter use. Um, so these are my resources um, that I use to kind of uh, create this talk. And, um, it, it, you know, the Sustainable Center, the Center for Sustainable Health Systems on the top right, has a lot of information um, and tools that can be used um, in a local environment. Um, if you guys are interested in kind of uh, looking for resources, um, Cascades is a great resource as well. Um, and that's it. Happy to take any questions. Fantastic. Thank you so, so much uh, for an excellent tour of really an important topic. And I would say in healthcare, you know, really um, our priority in most instances is do all that needs to be done for the patient in front of us, right? So sometimes I think this um, this topic of uh, reducing waste and such, you know, it kind of goes off to the side because we think we don't want to cut corners. So I really love the approach that you've outlined where we're taking a more methodical, taking a step back and see, okay, we're not saying to, you know, change our priorities with this individual patient necessarily. Let's take a step back and see where there's waste in the system, where that low hanging fruit is. Um, so thank you so, so much. And we've got a couple of questions in the chat. Um, uh, one that's listed out here and one uh, where we'll be uh, allowing Dr. Gerstein to um, ask the question himself. So I'll ask the first question here. Um, Hi there, thank you for this very important presentation. My name is Victoria Brzezowski and I'm the environmental management lead for HHS. Victoria, I hope I said your last name right. I'm working on a number of projects, including many of those mentioned during this presentation. I'd appreciate a connect with any who are interested in working with me and driving more change regarding MDIs, device reprocessing, choosing wisely, and other uh, prescription-related invitations, uh, patient food, et cetera. Please connect with me. And we've got the email address there. Or Yeah, perfect. So thank you so much, uh, Victoria. And that's over at HHS. Amanda, you're uh, based at St. Joe's. Do you want to kind of respond to um, the, the fact that R Victoria's uh, role exists there and that this is part of uh, what's embedded uh, into uh, Victoria's mandate and, and kind of comment on how we should be uh, evolving this across the city? Yeah, um, thank you, Victoria, for that comment. Um, 
You know, I, I do think it's a very important, um, as I love, I, I actually didn't know that there was an environmental management kind of department. And I wonder if there's avenues to kind of connect kind of across sites as well, and not just from HHS, but through J St. Joe's and HHS to work together to do these things. Because I'm sure that a lot of the root fact, root causes or driving issues are quite similar across sites. So if there's ways that we can bridge that, I'd be happy to kind of connect if anyone's interested and connect with you as well. St. Joe's also has a green team, says R. Khaled. Yep. Yeah, perfect. Um, so we had Dr. Gerstein uh, with his hand up for a question. So we'll allow him to unmute and then I'll come over to some of the questions and comments that are in the uh, chat. Hi, um, Amanda, thank you very much. Um, it was very um, uh, ex an excellent presentation and very important. But I, I think that there's, um, an important message um, that needs to be there for physicians to be engaged. As Madeline said, um, if I have a patient in front of me, that's my priority. My patient is not the climate. My patient is not the planet. My patient is Mr. Jones who's standing in front of me right now, and I want to do the best for him. So in all these PDSA cycles, um, I think you know, we, are, we are McMaster, we're evidence-based you know, capital of the world. Uh, in my view, um, uh, they should either only be done after there is very good um, RCT level evidence, either from, from uh, cluster randomized or other type trials, that the alternative approach is as good or as safe for the patient as the, as the former approach is. Or if not, the PDSA cycles should also be measuring um, patient outcomes together with all of the climate and other outcomes at the same time. That is not nearly as good as taking the opportunity to do cluster randomized trials. Like there was one done um, recently of less blood versus more blood drawn in patients showing equivalence. Um, uh, and that's 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 and that would give me confidence as a physician that I'm not doing harm because I and as a physician, I can only advocate for my patient's best interest. That is my primary responsibility. If I'm wearing different hats, then obviously I'm advocating for different interests. Could you just comment on that and how much? patient outcomes are part of the central part of this. Yeah, so I think um, I, I totally appreciate your comment and I agree that we're, we're in terms of what I'm trying to say is that we're not, um, a lot of the QI work is not trying to uh, change um, standard of care. Um, we're kind of leveraging what we have and what we know is within the safe realm of patient care and just backing off on things that uh, would either cause patient harm or what I'm trying to say in this talk is to contribute to climate change. And so um, and a comment on that or example would be like if we're talking about um, reducing blood work, and I think a lot of quality improvement kind of takes on the lens of what is best for the patient. That's a lot of that's where a lot of the drive for quality improvement work comes from. So um, there are benefits to less patient draws, uh, patient blood draws, anyways, for your patients. So I think, or you know, reduce fully catheter use. Um, you know, we talk about environmental sustainability with the manufacturing and the carbon emissions related to the disposal and manufacturing of that. But if you look at it, um, reduced cofolic catheter use also reduces catheter associated UTIs and, and things like that. So I think, um, I think they work in parallel or um, there's a symbiosis to both the quality improvement methodology, looking at reducing a lot of these um, uh, overuse priorities and patient care. And I think we can, frame it um, as uh, we are doing this for the benefit of the patient, because uh, truthfully, there are downstream effects of like overuse of antibiotics without antibiotic resource stewardship and things. So I think they fall in line. Um, and I want to comment on the RCTs as well. I think that um, a lot of these QI projects should be backed by good RCT data um, that show that there has been, like we wouldn't be doing improvement uh, work unless there has been uh, shown benefit um, that we're doing from previous data um, in literature. Perfect. Thank you. All right, I'll hand it over to Dr. Chung, who's going to get us caught up on the uh, lots of lots of um, discussion in the chat. Yeah, there seems to be a lot of comments uh, in the chat here related to um, uh, MDI use, and I think even during the last sort of iteration of uh, similar rounds by Dr. Sargent, there's a bit of controversy, especially if any of the respirologists are are, are 
on the rounds as well. Um, somebody asked if, if uh, the issue of uh, MDI, MDIs is being addressed here in Hamilton. It sounds like there is some ongoing work um, that's being done uh, with the formulary committee uh, at St. Joe's and perhaps even at HHS. But there are some, I guess, barriers depending on you know patients requiring uh, the use of aero chambers and even inhaler technique as well can sometimes uh, play a role in that decision making. Um, Dr. Khaled has... Uh, uh, put up a couple of links here, or there are actually a couple of links in the chat, one from Dr. Khaled for Peach Health Ontario, which was um, uh, the rounds that were given, I think, back in the uh, about a year ago uh, um, by Dr. Sargent uh, and Dr. Khaled uh, regarding a, a very similar topic. Um, and then I think Dr. Hofsek also posted the last couple of rounds that were related to climate change and healthcare as well. Um, there's also a comment here from Dr. Keith uh, regarding um, uh, DPIs with lactose and milk protein um, and avoiding uh, certain ones with milk allergy and only budesonide alone. Uh, DPI doesn't contain lactose. Um, budesonide with formoterol uh, does contain lactose. Um, so I think those are most of the comments that were in the chat there. Fantastic. Any Thank you questions? For, for summarizing there. And we've got a couple of more folks with their hands up. So we'll go first to Dr. Tallman. Um, Amanda, thank you so much for bringing attention, continuing to bring attention to what is, um, you know, the most impactful uh, issue in healthcare today in overall health of um of the human race. Uh, so thank you for that. It does seem that Canada is somewhat behind uh, in in uh, this area. So I think the more you and like-minded people do, the better. The one thing that you didn't discuss is sort of the, the big um, role of research and how research is funded and whether or not there's an appetite here or anywhere to be able to, you know, when a research project is proposed to bring forth sort of the impact on um, climate change of that research. Because I, I think, you know, in an academic in institution, this is, this is the, the site that, that we can actually make some, um, make some improvement in this. So there's such a, a huge issue for, for health of the entire population. Yeah. So thank you um, for that comment. I think um, in terms of funding for research, so um, the resources, the slides that the, I listed at the end there, um, some of them do kind of have um, support uh, for people who are interested in these projects. And so um, those could be a good resource to kind of tap into. Um, a lot of the QI work, I would say overall, is uh, fairly cost efficient. And um, so, um, you know, there would be, unless we're like leveraging huge changes that require additional costs. Um, remember the slide with the low, the fruit tree, um, a lot of it would actually uh, be cost saving to us rather than um, additional costs. So um, the research itself from a QI perspective may not need uh, like substantial funding, but it would be helpful to kind of have some remuneration um, for this kind of work uh, to support this kind of institutional level work um, in our organization for sure. Thank you so much. And we've also got, as our last question before we wrap up, uh, Dr. Holbrook. Yeah, thanks very much. Thanks, Amanda. It's been a great discussion. Just a quick comment and a question. Uh, so I am running a randomized trial, which largely involves deprescribing, it's sort of medication optimization. But it's surprising how complex, well, not surprising to the internist, but surprising how complex our hospitalized patients are. So it does take some expertise, I think, to do it well. And my question, I apologize, Amanda, I had to step out to take a call, but PPE has always been a bugbear of mine. <laughs> we wait, to my mind, we waste a lot of PPE, and for sure we're going to head into another epidemic or pandemic at some point where it's going to be a huge issue. I just wondered, is there anything on the horizon? We changed our gowns to those more plasticized and they're clean, but do you see anything more we could be doing in that area? Yeah, I. 
I, that's a huge, you're right. That's like one of the hugest, biggest components of waste, healthcare waste. Um, and I think largely like with the pandemic, we've contributed to it, but there's a lot of turnover from a surgical perspective as well. We see a lot of ORs turning over all these equipment and things like that. So there is a lot of drive in this like sustainable um, healthcare um, community to really leverage these changes. It's actually the number one talk if you kind of start to uh, do lit reviews of things that there's a lot of discussion around ways we can improve PPE use, but I don't think there's anything that I know of in the great finds kind of uh, locally here yet, unless there's a QI project or work that I'm, I'm not familiar with yet. Mm -hmm. So um, thanks again so much. We've, we've reached the end of our time, but this is such an important topic that um, I know these conversations will continue. Uh, Dr. Huynh, thank you so much for inspiring us all to find ways uh, both through formal quality improvement initiatives or as Dr. Holbrook has highlighted research uh, and then just in our day-to-day -day work looking for ways to um, uh, decrease the utilization of uh, materials that either contribute to um, uh, waste or uh, to carbon emissions. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you to Dr. Chung for co-hosting with me. Uh, it's been a pleasure. This will be this has been recorded and will be posted up on YouTube in the coming days. Uh, and we will be back again same time next Thursday morning uh, for Medical Grand Rounds, which will be uh, Dr. Katsanos, uh, as, uh, who's one of the neurology new recruits at HHS. So everybody have a fantastic day and a wonderful week, and we'll see you back next week. <laughs>